Welcome back. Dr. John Braccio again with you talking about trans hypnosis, talking about trans self hypnosis, and talking in terms of the CD that you will be using after you finish listening to me now. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about trance, okay? Trance is a very common thing that every day we go in and out of. We're not even aware of it. I mean, hypnosis, unfortunately, has come because of stage hypnotists, call it what you will, has become seen as something more than it really is. Dentists, psychologists, persons that really are well experienced in the field have really been using hypnosis for many, many years. In fact, people have, as long as people have been out and about, certainly have been using trance, but haven't always even been aware of it, or usually aren't even aware of it. Example. When you're reading a book, you're really looking at words, ink on a page. But when you're reading that book, you can be there. You can read Ivanhoe. You can read King Lear, Mad King Lear, out on the step on the mountain. You can read Romeo and Juliet. She that teach the torches to burn bright and deep. Never have I known true beauty until this night. You can read things and you can be there. You can be part of that experience. That is the form of trance, our imagination, that part of us that really is not bound by the earth, okay? Not bound by the earth at all. And you can be watching TV, okay? Not even hear anything else. You can be, at a, you can be watching or at a football game. A very important thing, a football game. You're there. You could be at the opera. You know, Questo il bacio di Tosca, when Tosca gets rid of Baron Scarpio. You can actually be so involved in these things, watching it, that you're in a form of trance. You don't hear anything else. You don't notice anything else. And many a husband and a wife has been condemned, or found fault with, if you will, for not paying attention. Glad my wife isn't here to hear this. Not paying attention. And often you're just listening to something else. You'll say, yes, yes, yes. And you're not realizing what you're even saying, yes, 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 too. Hopefully it wasn't buying a new car, going to dinner, doing something you really didn't want to do. But anyway. That's all form of trance. Another, you're riding in your car. And you could drive by a place where there's some, a lot of activity, a party in front of a house, and you won't even notice it. You're like an automatic pilot. Or all of us have gone on the highway. We've gone an exit or two beyond where we're going, and our only excuse is, oh my goodness, you were just in trance. And you don't remember every time you put on the brake, every time you do whatever it might be. That's why we have to retrace our steps sometimes, our steps, excuse me, because we're really on automatic pilot. That's all a form of trance. And trance self-hypnosis is nothing more than when we're guiding ourselves or someone is guiding us into this state, this condition. When we are able to relax, when we are able to put other things out of our mind completely, and we, were able to, we are able to focus on these other thoughts that are coming in to our mind. And when we are totally relaxed, when we're breathing in and breathing out, that is when we are the most open to the messages. And questions, Dr. Braccio, can a person do something that they wouldn't normally do in trance? Absolutely not. And if someone does something with a stage hypnotist, they have chosen to do this. Dr. Braccio, is it dangerous? No, it's not dangerous. It's a normal, everyday occurring situation. If I'm in trance and I'm uncomfortable, do I have trouble coming out? Well, of course not, because you're really just relaxing. And another thing to remember this, a lot of times people that are not experienced with hypnosis are sometimes disappointed. They'll say, well, I, I was relaxed, I listened to the words, but I, I thought something else was going to happen. Well, it really doesn't. I mean, yes, you can go into deep trance, you can go into deep relaxation, you can sit back, you can tune other things out and put things in. And that's all positive. That is hypnosis. But you don't lose track of yourself. You are you. This allows you to have the opportunity to be able to better, even better understand yourself. You're better able to be connecting the present and the past. Now, another concept within trans hypnosis, trans self-hypnosis, is that we have this totality of our life that we carry with us, this totality, this total totality of our life. And those experiences are all there. They're all back there, even if we're not even aware of them. Like even right now when I'm talking, I'm using all these words. Well, I'm not thinking about every word. If I were teaching you Italian or Spanish, 
You know how slow it goes to word, learn a word. Donde está la casa? Where's the house? If you're used to it, quiero ir a un lugar. You want to go to a place. Okay, but the point being, these are all things that have become a part of me. They become a part of you when you hear the words. You have the sharpness. You can tell one word to the next word. These are all things that are part of our unconscious. You run into a friend you haven't seen for 30 years. And just like you can go back through those years, talk about the teachers, talk about the kids. You can even smell the sense of the food in the home you may have been where you visited, whatever it might be. That's all part of the unconscious. And so much of that is there. And if we're talking about, it could be something like smoking, it could be something like I'm more specifically talking about right now, in terms of the test anxiety. Well, those messages that are coming to the forefront now, those are messages we don't want. We don't want those. I'm afraid, I'm scared, I can't do it, I'm not going to be able to breathe, I'm going to have a panic attack. No! We want those thoughts gone. And that's where we learn to take control of our thoughts. And that's where hypnosis can be helpful. Because when you're going into trance, when you've decided, I'm going to try to listen and make myself open, you're agreeing with yourself that you're going to try to make some changes in yourself. And you're going to try to take concepts, ideas, thoughts, statements, and you're going to try to internalize them and use them. It's a form of reinforcement. It's even a behavioral type of a situation. It's a cognitive structuring type thing. Nothing that you don't want to do, because hypnosis really is based, in terms of what I would call positive hypnosis, we're simply dealing with what we really want to do. We're adding a tool to the arsenal. We're going to war. We're talking about test anxiety. We're going to deal with test anxiety. And we're going to deal with it best by trying to kick out the old statements, the old concepts, the things that have already been negative in the past. And the goal is to turn everything the right way now. So if you say, I'm prepared, I'm ready to take the test. You don't have the things, rubbish, no, no, I'm not, I can't do this. Oh. No, nothing like that at all. No, I'm prepared. I'm ready. I'm armed. I can do it. I'm in control. I will determine what I'm thinking. So, with this kind of introduction, this statement, this explanation, I want you to use the CD regularly. It's also a relaxation tape. It's used for you to relax. And you can change concepts in it. You can change words. You can change statements. You can, after you've done it long enough, you can even do it yourself. You can put yourself in that condition. You put yourself in trance and you can do this just like that. I can right now close my eyes. Start breathing in. And if I use my normal relaxation, trance hypnosis strategies with myself, and I've been doing hypnosis for 25 years, okay, I can just tune all you guys out, and that's not what I want to do, because I really want you to be taking control of test anxiety, whether you're the, the young student, middle-aged student, old student, call it what you will, because I get older, old gets much older, of course, or if you are a parent, a loving parent, a loving friend of someone with test anxiety, then you also can use this information with the idea of trying to be helpful, having better understanding yourself. So anyway, we're now going to be moving forward. And again, I want you to be listening to this DVD regularly, ongoing. But at this particular point, I suggest that you go to the CD and use that now. Try to use that a couple times a day if you can, at least once a day, right, certainly around test time. And use the whole program on a regular basis. So anyway, I hope this has been helpful in terms of this last segment here. So let's go. Let's take control of our mind. Control, remember? Control what you're thinking. In control. And let's use a little trance self-hypnosis to help us in deep relaxation. Let's go for it. Welcome. My name is Dr. John Braccio. I'm most satisfied that you have determined to take part in this program that I have developed just for you. A program entitled, I'm Free from Test Anxiety. I have put this together based on my experiences of over 39 years as a teacher, 
as a teacher at a university college and also just in my general interactions with people and in private practice for many years as a psychologist. And I've tried to distill some of the key important things that I have seen that can be helpful. This program is divided into two parts. There is a DVD that you're obviously, if you're looking at me, you're seeing right now, which has actually three parts even on that. What I'm doing now, a general kind of an introduction. Then there will be, where I will be giving very specific strategies for how to deal with test anxiety. And then also a part where I want to talk to you about trance hypnosis. And the second part or will actually be a CD, which will be a trance hypnosis, self-hypnosis CD that I have developed for you. A little bit about me. I began my career in 1966 as a classroom teacher. I worked as a school psychologist, worked as a public school administrator, worked in government as a consultant and as a manager, taught a number of years graduate and undergraduate classes at Michigan State University, and for the past 26 plus years I have been working in the private sector as a private practice psychologist. My goal here is to be educational. It is not to try to interfere with any medical treatment you could be receiving, any type of psychotherapy or counseling, nothing like that. My goal is to give you information that can be helpful to you. Now let's talk a little bit about test anxiety. What is test anxiety? We hear it every day. Well, it can range from something very good. I mean, if a person is prepared, is cool, comes in ready to take that test, I'm going to really go in there. I remember one day I was out at a restaurant here in the East Lansing area, Michigan, and I ran into someone who had just taken the test for dental school and had done spectacularly well. And I happened to ask him, I said, well, were you nervous? And he says, not really. I had prepared. I was ready. I knew exactly what to do. Now, I might add, I don't hear that a lot. And particularly in my work and working with people, I'm usually seeing people that are just the reverse, under a lot of stress. Now, my particular work environment, if you're working in East Lansing, Michigan, you're in a community with 45,000 students at Michigan State University. We have Cooley Law School, the largest law school in the nation. And we have a community college here, Lansing Community College, with 20,000 plus students. Plus we have state government here. We have all kinds of reasons, people, where test anxiety can be a factor. And I have worked with many, many persons over these many, many years and have tried to find things that can be helpful. So but anyway, one part of test anxiety can be very positive. A little bit, that little bit of fire. You don't want to go in there kind of do, dull, not ready to go, not ready to do, because you certainly won't do well. You want to have, it's kind of getting the summum bonum, Aristotle's summum bonum, in the middle, kind of ready. Okay. Then we go from being ready, little anxiety in a positive way, into the negative areas. And this can be where you're nervous, you're upset, call it what you will, all the way to panic attacks. Panic attacks, of course, if you've ever had them or seen one with them, are just horrible, horrible things. Now, I want to talk a little bit. We use the dsm 4 Let me just show this even to you. You may have heard of it. You can certainly see <laughs> something I use a lot. This is kind of a beat-up book here. And in there, this is where we come up with all the diagnoses in terms of for persons. Anxiety, depression, character disorders, call it whatever you will. But this is here a definition for a panic attack. Okay, let me just um, read this. A discrete period of intense fear or discomfort in which four or more of the following symptoms developed abruptly and reached a peak within 10 minutes. Palpitations, pounding heart, accelerated heart rate, sweating, trembling or shaking, sensations of shortness of breath or smothering, feeling of choking, chest pain or discomfort, nausea or abdominal distress, feeling dizzy, unsteady, lightheaded or faint, derealization, feelings of unreality, or depersonalization, being detached from oneself, fear of losing control or going crazy, fear of dying, parenthesis, numbness or tingling sensations, paresthesias, excuse me, and then chills or hot flashes. Now, these are things that 
really can debilitate. And I've seen many, many persons with these symptoms or after the symptoms. I've seen many persons that have vomited, have, have had to leave test situations. And that's kind of the extreme, the real panic. That is the extreme. But if you ever develop those type of situations, those are overwhelming type of feelings. And of course, the less so, but still things that can slow you down in a negative way are the great worry, the great concern. So my point here is not to try to overwhelm you, okay, or put great fear in you. It's just to let you know if you have any of these symptoms, they certainly can get worse if not control, try to work with. And also that you can take control. Yes, you can. Yes, you can take control. And my goal is to give you ideas and strategies that can help you. And also, that doesn't mean you can't work with your family physician or psychiatrist, whoever you might be working with, in terms of drug therapy in addition to. I've always said one size does not really you know, fit all. And a lot of this stress and tension, we kind of hear a lot about this fight or flight, in terms of our prehistoric days, if you will, where the body gears up to defend itself, like we're trying to defend ourselves, the story of the saber-toothed tiger, whatever it might be. Well, in this day and age, we certainly don't need that. But when the adrenaline gets going, all the blood gets moving, the palpitations come, we have deep problems with our breathing. That's the, those are the symptoms. And they do go back to this kind of previous type of a time. So what we need to do is try to use cognitive restructuring or thinking or call it whatever you will that we can just, you know, really take, I guess, really take control. Now, who are the people that often have test anxiety? Who are they? They're everywhere. They're, they're kind of like an every person. But typical, the most typical would be people that kind of almost seem to have a, a genetic predisposition. They're kind of persons that seem to kind of, their emotions go up and down very quickly. And they're also the worriers, people that worry all the time. And then you also have the the perfectionist, someone that has to do perfect. A person, I just got 99 on my test, I'm so upset. And the next person got 85. They're the procrastinators, people that know they have to be studying, but they don't, and they're not ready. They're the people that even when they go in and take tests, they just can't focus, and things happen. They're always worried something bad is going to happen. Things go blank on them. They just can't do well. Well, if you fit in one of those categories, or even somewhere else, that you're really worrying because you're trying to please others, you're worried what others are, others are going to be thinking of you, whatever the reason might be, and again, I'll talk about this a little more in the next segment in terms of what, when I'll be talking, but you really have to get out of these roles. You have to quit being the perfectionist. You have to quit being the procrastinator. You have to really quit being a person who's trying to focus on what you know what others want and if you have the predisposition you have to learn strategies and how to keep calm how to relax that's where we look at yoga we look at hypnosis we even look at medications we look at things that can really be helpful to us now my goal for you is i think a good goal you know i've always loved tigers in fact i love cats actually and i've always enjoyed cats and since with animal planet on cable I've already had a chance even to see these big, magnificent cats. And the beauty of a big tiger like this is you don't mess with a tiger in the jungle, okay? You don't mess with a tiger. I remember I was reading or listening to Animal Planet, and they were talking about that tigers and lions just kind of fall down and sleep wherever they want. I mean, you, know, you don't see the birds or the baboon or whoever might come by and just bother these folks. Now, I want you... For whatever the reason you're having problems with test anxiety, I want you to try to visualize yourself in this way. I really want you to see yourself. Look at this is a mighty, mighty tiger in my estimation. Kind of looking around serene, in control of the environment. Remember, if you've ever had experiences with cats, they're great predators. They're always ready to be on immediate alert. You can have a little cat in your house. You can be sitting there, this most peaceful, lovable cat. Have something fall on the ground, and that cat almost turns into a mighty predator, jumps, muscles, jumps off, 
or if they see something. Like our cat at our house is the most precious, wonderful cat. Kalu is the name. Daughter actually got it, and we've, we have it. And um, just a few Sundays ago, I was sitting in the living room, just peacefully sitting there with Kalua, just sitting there purring. Well, a cat, unbeknownst to me, had just come up outside on our porch, and I swear it was amazing. It was like Kalua turned into this 5,000-pound tiger, just jumped up and ran right over to that window. You know, call it snarling, call it whatever you will. Now, my, what's, what's my point here? My point is this. I want you to really feel confident, but I also want you to have strength. I want you, as you prepare for taking a test, to be confident and try to get this image in you. Try to get this type of an image. You're a tiger. You could be an eagle. You can be whatever you feel is a powerful symbol, but someone who's going in confident. Now, I have one other thing I want to show you. Someone gave this to me, okay? This is another thing that I think is just a beautiful uh, painting or drawing, whoever did it. It was a card sent to me. And look at this. We've got this beautiful cat and a big lion in there. Okay? Now look at that. Isn't that nice? Now, I want you, when you're taking a test, to feel like a lion. King or queen, call it what you will, of the jungle. Not that there's anything wrong with being a cat, because I've already told you how much I love little cats, too. But try to be confident. Try to get the image in your mind of you are a strong person. And remember, in life, what we think, if we can control what we think, we control our life. That is really pivotal. If others control it or if we allow other thoughts to control us, then we basically lose control of our life. So again, what I want you to do, try to get an image of yourself, of a really a mighty tiger. Yes, it could be a, and it can be any animal you want. I mean, I also, lions, I know people that like eagles, I know people that like horses, whatever it might be. But free from these feelings and these thoughts that are kind of really kind of doing you in. And what I want you to do, another image, I would like you as you do this, and you're kind of, you're moving forward, and you're taking your test. I want you alert, okay? I want you ready to do what you have to do, but I'd like you to have this view. Look at Lighthouse. Why not, why not look upon when you're taking this test that this can be a safe haven, a place for you to express what you know, to do the best you can do, to use this testing situation as a time and place where you're able to learn you're able to see what you can do, what you know, use what you learn for a future time in terms of learning what you might have to do differently. Call it what you will, but try to see it. We've got here, nice lighthouse representing safety. Got a beautiful sunset up here with a lighthouse. I just love things like this. And these are images in your mind. If you're in taking a test and you're all of a sudden feeling a little anxious, a little nervous, you can just start breathing in and breathing out and relaxing and try to get this image. That would be very useful, very helpful to you. And you can use any other setting in your own mind. It doesn't matter. But these are some things that I feel are good constructs and things that you can use. So let's leave this here and now I'm going to be talking to you about very specific things in relation to how to deal with test anxiety. Well, welcome back. Now, I'm going to be talking about specific strategies, things that you can do to deal with test anxiety. What I decided to do for years, I've written regular columns for the Lansing State Journal on questions and answers that relate to parents, to families, to situations, call it what you will. And I'm just going to talk about a few of these here. This here is five ways to reduce everyday anxiety. This happens to be something that I wrote. This is on actually January 4, 2005. And it's a, it's a generalized anxiety situation. Let me just read this to you. The question, I don't know what's been happening to me. I've always been anxious. But now I seem to be worrying about everything. I even worry about my worrying. 
My kids and husband have told me to try to settle down, but I can't get the fears out of my mind. I worry about the health of my family, my husband's job, the education of my children, and even the effects of global warming. I get tense and irritable, I can't concentrate, and I often can't sleep well. My mother and her sisters are just like me. What do I have and what can I do about it? Now, this is what you would call generalized anxiety. Now, my point, that's really not what we're talking about right here, even though you will find often people with test anxiety also do worry about everything else. So this is just a good example of someone who's just worrying about everything. So when, you're hearing, when you hear someone talk about generalized anxiety disorder, that's really you know, what you're talking about. And of course, how to deal with those, with that particular set of circumstances, is exactly the same or very similar to some of the things we'll be talking about in terms of strategies to deal with test anxiety. Okay, then in terms of how anxiety, test anxiety really hits everyone, this is another one. This actually goes to December 14, 2004. And I've, by the way, written hundreds of these types of articles. This one here, let me just read the question to you. Our 16-year-old son agonizes over his tests. He always gets excellent grades, but drives himself and the rest of us crazy as he worries about each upcoming test and is convinced he will fail it. He can be upset and worried a full week before the test. A few of his friends are the same way. He is so well prepared, so it is very hard to understand why he does this to himself. Right after he gets an excellent grade on a test he had agonized over, he starts again when the next test comes up. Now, this is a young person, and this is a person doing very well. And I might add, I have found over the years, many persons that I've worked with, and I've worked with literally hundreds of people in relation to test anxiety and stress, that like this child here, many like this particular person, they really do well, but they're very, very, very worried. They're always worried something will happen. It's almost like there was a book out some years ago called The Imposter, Ph Imposter Phenomenon. It's like they really believe they're going to be found out, that they're really not going to be doing that well. But this is a case where persons tr constantly in discomfort, constantly worrying, and certainly would need to learn how to put things in perspective. And that, again, is something we'll be talking about here in a minute. Now, I have another one here. This one here is strategies can minimize test anxiety. Okay, now this was this actually was something May 10, 2005, and let me read this. This is an adult, so test anxiety hits everyone. It doesn't just hit one age. It can hit a five-year-old. It can hit a ten-year-old. It can hit a twenty-year-old. It can hit an eighty-year-old. This is kind of an interesting situation. I try to be a support for my high school daughters who are always anxious and worried before taking tests. Now I'm back in college and find myself as anxious as they are. What's the problem here and what should we do? Okay, well this is a case clearly of test anxiety, is it not? And worrying, so here we had the mother. This is kind of cute. The mother has been the guide, the person helping the daughters in terms of dealing with their anxiety. And it turns out that she has the same situation. Now, she may have ironically picked up some of this from the daughters over the years. Or it could be kind of a, almost a genetic type of a um, predisposition. You know, I know how scientific that is, but certainly I have seen, I seem to see, see anxious people often create anxious people. And it's not just, I think, from just seeing each other. It comes certainly from some of the chemical makeups that um, we certainly you know, carry with us. So those are just, I just gave you a few examples. And if you can talk to family physicians, you'll find huge numbers of persons that come in to see them, percentage-wise, are in for some type of anxiety. And you can talk to psychologists, and you'll find the very same thing. Generalized anxiety, test anxiety, phobic-type reactions, the... Um, panic attacks. So persons, in a way, are certainly part of a large group. And I think that's another thing important for people to realize. If they're having a lot of problems with test anxiety, they have to know they're not alone. And they have to know there are some ideas and strategies. But let me talk here about what are some of the causes? What brings, what brings these things on? I already mentioned, I think, with some people, there, there's almost this physical predisposition that they can just kind of really get worried or really worked up very, very fast. Um, I think we also have expectations or pressures from others. 
I had a girl calling, call me on the phone here a while ago, just crying, all upset, worried that she was doing poorly in school. And as we talked, it became clear she was worried about what her parents were going to think, what family members would think. And I made the point to her, I said, you know, I feel very bad about this. However, you have to be thinking about yourself, how you're feeling. You're the person crying, you're the person really down. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to minimize what parents or peers or family might think. But if, if you're going to have your life be determined on a test based on what others want you to do, then you've already lost control of your life. And there's nothing you can do because you're never going to be able to always be in control of your feelings because of the worry. You have to put things in perspective. Sure, you want to do well and have people be proud of you, but you just can't have things determined by other people. And if that is a situation that you're in, you definitely need to talk to your parents, talk to friends, talk to whoever it might be. Let them know that you just can't do that. That is not a reasonable thing. Another would be past experiences. Many people, because they're anxious and worried, they don't do well on tests. So what do they expect? They expect they won't do well in the old self-fulfilling prophecy. What do you do? You go into the test and poof, you do poorly. Then there's basically the fear of failure. And these are the persons that catastrophize everything. They're always worrying. The worst is going to happen. I'm going to do bad. They're so fearful of failure that it utterly debilitates them. They go blank. They lose track. They're reading things over and over again. All they do is look at the clock. They notice everything. And that's just um, that you can't do that. You have to be in control. Then there's a lack of confidence. You can just be lack confidence. It doesn't matter what you know. You just feel you're not going to do well. And listen, you can do well. You have to get those thoughts out of your mind. Build your confidence. Build your confidence. Do well. I have found so many people through talking, through medication, through relaxation, call it what you will, have really been able to control themselves. And I really believe if you can try to internalize some of the ideas that I'm putting here on this particular DVD, and you also listen regularly to the trance self-hypnosis tape, which is really deep relaxation. I'll be explaining this more to you in the next segment after I'm done here. Then you can really be in control. You can take control. And I would love you to be able to say, I'm free from test anxiety. Say it. I'm free from test anxiety. It even sounds good. Well, let's talk about some of the things to do, okay? First of all, be prepared. Be prepared. Remember that. The best soldier is well-armed. Remember that. Be prepared. Even overstudy, if you have the time, learn something over, over, overstudy. Be ready. And then review the course material and study the main concepts. These are things, these are things that you really have to do also. And I'll be having a companion DVD specifically on strategies in terms of taking tests. But here we're talking um, most specifically about dealing with test anxiety. When studying, ask yourself what questions may be asked and then answer them. You're preparing yourself. You're reducing the anxiety by trying to figure out. Talk to the teacher. Talk to the professor. So often I find, and again, let me talk a little bit about some of my experiences here. Having evaluated a number of students from Michigan State University and from Cooley Law School, there's just so much pressure on these kids. I mean, so much pressure these days. They worry so much about what's going to happen that you really have to know what's going on. I, I've talked to persons that have come to see me, and I'll ask them, well, what's going to be on the test? How's this done? You know, often they don't even know. They say, I don't know. I don't know. I'm just worried. And I say, well, you really ought to know. Is it multiple choice? Is it essay? Is it some combination? Is it fill-in? What is it? So just being prepared is very, very important. I also mentioned don't cram. Now, a lot of people, for whatever the reason, the procrastinators of the world, those that put things off, really want to cram. Well, testing is really set up to measure information you've acquired over a period of time. And cramming is often forgotten and you can't retrieve it. And if you're in something like law school, graduate programs, sciences, whatever it might be, languages, you just can't do that. I don't care if you're in junior high, high school, college, you may get away with it for all, but eventually it'll come back and do you in. The best way to be reducing stress and anxiety, stress and anxiety in terms of testing, 
is to be prepared every day, work at what you're doing. Try to be in control. Now, another thing, a kind of a basic concept, but an important one. Recognize that if you stay calm, your chances for higher grades are greater than if you are anxious and panicky. It's really so obvious that it's amazing how many people say, this is just the way I am. I'm just always anxious and always worried. Woe is me. And I say, rubbish. You don't have to be that way. And recognize the calmer you can stay, the better you're going to do on the test. Calm, in control, well armed, okay? Prepared. Educati, the old Latin word. You're ed educated. The person's educated, but part of it is knowing how to deal with life, deal with things. Okay. Now, eat nutritiously and moderately before the test. Get a good night's sleep. These are just really basic things. Come in prepared. You know, if you have your car for a long trip, you really do. You get your engine ready. You make sure the gas is in there. You make sure all the hoses are working. Everything. You're the same thing. When you're going in to take a test, don't go in there when you didn't eat anything. You're anxious. And then another amazing thing to me is there are people that actually will even drink alcohol before taking a test, trying to calm down. Now, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Okay, I mean, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. You know, I've heard of people taking medications that they take too much. They can take a Wellbutrin, they can take a Xanax, they can take whatever it is and too much of it. And, and, there, and then you've got people, on the other hand, who refuse to take any medications. And I think, ideally, if you can learn how to deal with yourself physically and emotionally without taking medications, I think that is better. That's, of course, the strategy, a lot of what I have here for you, trying to have you use your own nature, your own inbred your, your internal ways of dealing with stress and anxiety. So eating nutritiously, eating moderately before the test, and being ready, ready like the car on a long trip. Just try to think you are, in a sense, a machine going in there to do your best. Now, at night, after you've quit studying, relax, just relax, and try to think about the test. And you can use some self-hypnosis, deep relaxation. You can use the CD that I've developed for you here, that I have for you. Just use it. I've, I, many people I've worked with that use my deep relaxation CDs or in t tapes over the years. But this is one I made just for you in relation to test anxiety. And just put your head back. And just relax. And you breathe in. Feeling the whole lungs all the way. And you're just relaxing in your thinking. In control. In control. Within 30 seconds, in fact, I could do it right now. I better watch out. I could actually lose track of even where I am just by relaxing. And that's what you have to do. And then listen if you have a trans hypnosis or your own images and thoughts on your mind, in your mind, and just relax and take control. Now, another thing is thought stopping. What a great technique. It's a behavioral cognitive strategy. When the negative thought comes in, you kick it out. Okay? You thought you stop it. One, and you can use anything you want. You can be the baseball player. You can be the golf. You can be a golfer. You can be some the, the soccer person. You can be anybody you want to be. Or anything. You just throw the darn thing out. You don't let it come in. When that negative thought comes in, you kick it out. You don't let it ruin your day. So if a thought comes in, this is actually cognitive restructuring also, saying things, cognitive meaning thinking. Thought comes in, I'm going to do horrible on that test. Rubbish. You kick that thought out, and then you, of course, replace it with a good one. I'm going to do well. I don't know how well prepared I am. Rubbish. I'm prepared. You kick these things out. You kick them out. And that's what you do with your mind. Remember, one of the most important concepts for you to learn for the rest of your life and to pass on from generation to generation is if you control what you can think about, what you think about, you are in control. But if you allow thoughts to come in that you don't even want there to take control, you will not be in control of your own life. Okay. Now, avoid the caffeine, the... Certainly nicotine, certainly smoking under any conditions we ought not to do. Uh, but soda, coffee, chocolate, all of these things, you don't need that before you're taking a test. 
And if you're relaxed, you've had good sleep, you've eaten nutritiously, you're ready to go, that's what you want to do. You want to be on a natural high. That's what you really want to be able to do. Now, as time approaches to take the test, on the day of the test, if you're walking over, if you're having a parent's driver, if you're driving yourself, you're getting ready, just, I want you to be relaxing. da 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 Just relaxing. Just relaxing. Remember? You know, for thousands and thousands of years, it's one of the most basic strategies that human beings have used to be in control of themselves and their feelings. Just the relaxing. Breathing in, breathing out, breathing, breathing, breathing. An article I recently wrote here for the newspaper, I got an email from a person who actually wrote a very nice email indicating the importance of breathing. Someone who had worked with students for many years. And never underestimate that. That's another one, as I'm giving you these thoughts to think for yourself for a lifetime and to pass on. It's another one. Deep breathing, relaxation. You know, people say, Dr. Bracho, do you think yoga works? Do you think trance meditation works? Do you think that whatever it might be, I say any of these things work. They can be, if you believe it and, and you can really learn how to relax and control hypnosis, any of these things. I use trance hypnosis, something I've worked with for probably hundreds of people for 25 years, normally in my normal practice in terms of a psychologist. But it's a very basic thing that people go in and out of all the time. And again, I'll be talking about this um, you know, a little later. Um, when you come to the test location, get there early. Get there early. Don't just run in there, oh my goodness, I'm late. Oh, don't do that. Rubbish again. You're, and keep the word rubbish. Cut that word. Good R's on there. Good Italian or Spanish sound. And get there early. Get a seat with minimal distractions. Very important. And stay away from the doom and gloom crowd, under any circumstances, I might add. You don't want to talk to people. How are you? <laughs> they're, they're out of control. <gasps> They're, they're hyperventilating, they can barely breathe because they're only getting this much of their lungs, so they're kind of even losing oxygen to the brain. Just what you don't need. They need to work on that. That's for them to do. You're trying to work on this yourself, so you're going to come there and relax. And, and also, there's nothing wrong with just breathing in, breathing out, even counting in one, two, one, two, one, two, or counting to 20, one, two, three, four. Call it what you will, but you're there and you're ready to go. And that's very, very important. And another thing, don't let a test define you. Don't let the test, don't allow it to determine who you are. Look upon a test as something that you can learn from. I mentioned this earlier. Something that you can use as a learning experience, okay? You go in, we'll make it real simple. You know, do some addition. One and one is two, two and two is four, three and three is six. You do that, you know you, you've done well, you know that. But let's just say for whatever the reason you get confused or you don't know. You go one and one is three, okay? Now, I'm giving silly examples, but I'm just trying to make a point here. If you then can get the aha, the old gestalt, aha, and insight, you can learn what you did wrong. Don't say, I am stupid. Rubbish, don't do that. You have to say, ha ha, I won't do that again. Try to, you know, we're on earth. No one here is to be perfect, okay? The goal is to do as well as we can. To try to work hard. Okay, do well. Okay, now, so if you take a test and you make some mistakes, now if you make some foolish mistakes, then, then you can say to yourself, I won't do that again. And again, the, the point is not to be mad at yourself. Guilt is a very destructive, useless emotion, I might add. If you do something wrong, you make up for it if it's in relation to a person. If you do something silly on a test or something, you learn from it and you don't do it again. That's part of learning. A test ought to teach us something that we have learned and we can learn from it. It ought not to define us and ruin our day. It ought not to do that at all. And if we can use tests as learning tools, they become positive and not negative. And fortunately, some people do do that. Many people do that. And many people that I've talked to over the years 
because I've done so many law students, so many graduate students here in town. Um, and then I was in the Metro Detroit area many, many years and worked with many persons there over this test anxiety, self-esteem issues. Uh, replace these neg the negative self-talk with positive. That's another thing. I really want you, I keep saying it over and over and over again, and have replacement statements. I said this before, but I want to say it again. I'm going to do badly today. Rubbish, I'm going to do well. I'm not prepared. If you are prepared, yes, I am prepared. Okay? I'm a loser. Rubbish, I'm a winner. And don't let these things get you down. I'm going to get so nervous I won't be able to breathe. Rubbish, I'm going to breathe. In fact, I'll show you. And then show the lie. Show the lie by doing it. That's what you want to do. And another thing, too, you can also work on visualization. Now, this is something, of course, that you can use with the trance self-hypnosis CD that, I'm, that, I, that I have for you as part of this um, set of I'm free from test anxiety. But try to get images in your mind. For some reason, I like ocean settings. I like lake settings. I can just think in my own mind. I can just think, I lived in the South Bay in California for some years, in Manhattan Beach, the Marina del Rey area, just beautiful Torrance Beach, Redondo Beach. These are beautiful settings. Go up in California, the Big Sur, those areas, the glorious west coast of Michigan, up near the dunes, um, Grand Haven, Saugatuck, all these beautiful places. And those are great images. There's actually, in Saugatuck, Michigan, at the state park, there's a very long, it must be a mile, where you have to walk through all these beautiful trees and woods. It's just, it's just a fantasy place to get over to Lake Michigan. And you come upon Lake Michigan if it's a sunny, beautiful day. It's so beautiful. You've got the, you're up, kind of up in the air. I don't know how, kind of, I don't want to say a mountain, but certainly up on this big hill. You go down and it's just beautiful water. There are people playing. There are people doing things. The waves are coming in, and you're really tired after this walk, particularly if you've carried something, because it's kind of up and down, but it's just a beautiful setting. Now, I'm just mentioning things I like, because I can close my eyes, and my wife and I have taken that walk. In fact, we do that a lot in the summer, because we just love the west coast of Michigan, and just love to take that walk, okay? It's beautiful. Another place in California, or excuse me, mention California, in Florida is Fort Lauderdale. I love the walk at Fort Lauderdale. You can walk all the way down to Primonte's Pizza Place on one end, all the way over to where the state park is, you know, where people can park there, I should say. It's, it's probably a mile or a couple miles walk. Just a beautiful area. The waves are coming in. The sand is there. The, the beach, the sun, all these really nice places restaurants, hotels, and people just having a good time. Or the excitement, nothing on earth like South Beach in Miami, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. You hear all these European languages, you hear this, all this Spanish um, going on from the South Americans, the Cubans. It's just, there's nothing like it. But these are images. Get your own images. Find your images that you really like. It could be in a backyard. It could be on a lake. But be able to visualize and bring these thoughts to your mind. It's just wonderful. I can I'm just just thinking here. I'm talking to you, and I'm enjoying these thoughts. That's not what I'm even here for. I'm enjoying myself, and I'm supposed to be trying to be helpful to you. And also, basic muscle relaxation is another thing too. You know, just you can take all the parts of your body. You can even just take start with your your hand, your fist. You can just make it very tense, and then let it go. Do all the parts of your body, from here all the way to the tips of your toes, all the parts of your body. And just relax and all the time be breathing in. But you're getting the tension and then you relax. It's just a wonderful thing to do. And these are things that you can do. Okay? Now, these are ideas that you really, that I'm trying to give you. These are ideas for you to do. And you can do this. I want to go back to this concept of controlling what you think about, determining what your thoughts are. If you're like the vast majority of people, when they honestly think about it, they don't, generally haven't even thought about this this much, they don't control what they're thinking about. Thoughts bother them that they have no control over. And that, of course, gets somewhat into the trans hypnosis concept that 
there's the subconscious part that feeds us all these negative thoughts that we're not able to get rid of. But again, I'm going to talk about that shortly. But for now, I want you to try to internalize these thoughts, these things I've been talking about, being prepared, having a nutritious meal when you're going, be not cramming, to be trying to be positive, getting to the test setting on time, or even, I should say, early where you're there, finding a good place to do it, all the time kind of looking back and breathing in and breathing out. And if when you're taking the test, when you're taking the test, let's just say you are getting a little anxious, you're a lot better off to just stop for a minute, put the pencil or pen down, if you've got a computer, whatever it is, and just sit back. Just relax for a minute. You'll do better. You'll waste so much time if you're rereading, if you're hearing every little sound. Just as I'm doing this, I've actually taken myself, I'm actually over at Saugatuck again, walking. The rays of sun are coming in between all these beautiful trees. Oh my goodness, it's just, just wonderful. Even when I hit my ring here on my desk, it didn't really interfere because I'm relaxed. I want you to do things like that. So when you take that test, you just realize, can you even see how relaxed I am even talking about this? And that's what I want you to be able to do. And staying away from triggers, things that really bother you, staying away from the gloom and doom people, staying away from a place in the test room where you're taking the test that you may be really distracted, call it whatever you will. Now, I mentioned before that the use of medication can be helpful, and that's really true. I'm not the least bit trying to say that persons cannot be helped with a medication, because many people, you know, and also I might add, a lot of people with test anxiety, it can certainly lead to types of depression too, because if you're really, if you're anxious and worried all the time, that can lead to a person being depressed. I have done a DVD, I might add on depression too, depression and anxiety as far as that goes. And so often these things can interact with others. They can also, they're called comorbid. You could have test anxiety, but you could also be depressed. You could have all kinds of things going on at the same time. So certainly, this is something you would work out with your family physician, your psychiatrist, or whoever you might you know, be working with. And I certainly have seen many people help with various medications. However, I feel that everyone agrees that the best way to try to deal with test anxiety is to try to take control of ourselves, the way we look at things, the way we are can be able to control our thoughts, so we really don't need any of the medication. So anyway, at this point, I want you again to be aware you're in control, you can be in control, you can do the best you can, don't let others control you, don't let other feelings control you, you have to do it for you. It's like when I talk to people about stopping smoking or reducing in weight, whatever it might be, you ultimately have to do it for you. You can do it. I have all the confidence in the world that if you determine that you're going to minimize test anxiety, and you try to do some of the things that I've talked about today here, and I want you to go back to the tiger, to the lighthouse, to some of these beautiful settings I mentioned to you that I've seen in my lifetime, and you try to fill your life with relaxation more and peace in the midst of all the other activities that you may have. These are your anchors. These are your points, and you can do it. So anyway, we're done here. I'm now going to be talking to you about trans self-hypnosis, try to explain that to you a little bit so you're maybe more knowledgeable, maybe even more comfortable in terms of using the CD that I've also put together for you. So I have confidence, and again, to, to listen to this over and over again could actually be helpful too to reinforce a lot of these statements. So again, best to you. I'm confident in you, and as an educator trying to be helpful, I just want the very best for you.